Wow, I just started recording and immediately coughed in the microphone. Wow, that was a way to start out a day. Has everybody, has everybody emailed Dr. Otero a happy birthday today? Okay, it's a requirement to do that for this course. No, it's not a requirement to do that. Okay. But if you want to do that, it is her birthday. So um, happy Monday, everybody. I guess I don't get to say that to you next Monday. We will not be in class next Monday because of Labor Day. And so I guess depending on what you do over Labor Day weekend, it can be an extended weekend or you'll be doing something else. So we will, we will not be here. We will not be here. Um, also, quick reminder, um, so far, everything seems to be going reasonably well uh, with the uh, homework and assignments. We've had some technology issues, but uh, those are limited to a few individuals. So I, I apologize to those individuals, but for those of you who have not had technology issues, it looks like uh, uh, working, working well. Uh, I will give you some feedback probably Wednesday. My GTRA is working on uh, grading the assignments. So if there's anything that I desperately need to tell you about. I would love just one time, just, you know, my very first assignment not to have any feedback whatsoever other than you guys did great, you know, and I, I hope that's where it is. I hope that, I hope that the feedback is just like you, you, everybody listened to everything I said to the first week. And it's just kind of like, I'm going to make Dr. Barnes proud, you know, not that you don't already make me proud. I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying. All right. Uh, today, we are going to wrap up chapter three. Um, we are going to talk about, uh, specifically, we're going to talk about materiality. And so we've already deferred a little bit to materiality and talked a little bit about chapters one and two, but we're going to take a deeper dive into this. This is, uh, this is going to be a little bit, it's hard to define this one. Part of this is going to be very easy to understand because you're accounting or accountants, you're accounting majors, accountants, and you do like quantitative information. And this will be one of the very few things that we'll do that's quantitative in this course. There will be a few of them. There will be some quantitative exercises. Uh, this will be one of them. The problem being is that it's not necessarily an intuitive quantitative exercise. Uh, some of the stuff we're going to be talking about is a little bit weird. Um, when we get to that point, I'm going to caution you to say, pay close attention, take diligent notes, because it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't follow a straightforward routine. That being said, um, it is important to understand it's a, it's, a, it's a critical detail as our evaluation of our opinions. Basically, our opinions are evaluate our our our, poke, our our opinions are based on what we believe materiality represents. And so let's go ahead and discuss a little bit about what we mean by materiality. So back in the first lecture, what did I say about the concept of reasonable assurance? And specifically when we said in the first lecture, I contrasted it to absolute assurance. Now, why did I say that we use reasonable assurance? Because even if the auditor does a perfect job, there's a chance that like, the audit will still have issues and these Right. Yeah, we can only do so much work, okay? As Truman students, you're aware of that. Um, but uh, you can only do so much work until you kind of lose your mind. And as auditors, we have to say there's a certain point where we're going to not do any more work. We, we're just human beings. And even though auditors tend to go beyond, well above and beyond the limits of normal human uh, human endurance, something we, we take pride in and shame at the same time, uh, we, uh, we do have a limitation to the amount of work that we can do. It's just we can't achieve absolute assurance. It's not possible. So... An auditor designs an audit to provide reasonable assurance of detecting misstatements that are of sufficient magnitude to affect the judgment of reasonable financial statement users. So basically what we're saying is, we're not trying to find every mistake. We're trying to find every mistake that's of a certain amount, okay? Or in aggregate to do not exceed upon, upon a certain amount. And again, the, the intuition that's pretty, uh, pretty simple. Um, you're doing your homework and uh, you make a mistake on your homework and it costs you a half a point. You're probably like, oh, well, <laughs> I say you're probably like, OK, that's not a big deal. I mean, some of you may be kind of like, I've got to get that half a point back, even if it doesn't matter in your final grade. You just got to get it. I had one student back my first year teaching. She was not not just a straight A student. She was like a straight 100 percent student. And one exam, she got two points off and she came to my office and argued to me for like 15 minutes why she deserved those two points back. All right. I've never had quite a student nearly as rigorous as that. So high standards, high standards, definitely for Truman students. But yeah, so if it's half a point, you're probably not going to care as much as if it was 20 points on an assignment. All right. There's a difference there. We're just concerned about what a certain threshold is. So materiality is assessed in terms of potential effect of a misstatement on decisions made by a reasonable user of the financial statements. So we've already talked a little bit about that. We had the definition that we uh, discussed uh, um 
we discussed a little bit uh, a little bit already as far as what we mean by the decision making of users. This is actually how FASB defines materiality. They say if it's enough to affect the decisions of users of the financial statements, then it's material. That was the definition. Now, this is reinforced by the statement that's in the audit report. So the audit report reads, the financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the company. Does this say the financial statements are 100% correct? No, it says they are close enough. Materially speaking, these are this is close enough. If I say that I've got $10,000 in my bank account, don't I wish, if I said I had $10,000 in my bank account, and it's $9,999.50. I'm close enough. I'm happy with that. My father, on the other hand, he would have been like, where's that 50 cents? I've got to audit until I find that 50 cents, okay? Some people have different judgments on that. That being said, we can kind of use some guidelines to establish what we believe is truly material, what that, what that concept means. All right, so uh, an important part of audit planning is to determine the overall materiality for the financial statements, which we call planning materiality, and to decide upon tolerable misstatement for significant counts and disclosures. Now, what this means is we're going to walk through this in two phases. We're going to determine what is materiality for the audit as a whole. What is the amount that the audit has to be within in order for us to be comfortable? Once we've established that amount, we're going to go to each individual account, and in some cases, disclosures, though we won't look at those in this course. We will look at each individual account and say, how much could this account need to be uh, close to buy? Or what is the or was the proximity for the account? This is where things get a little bit crazy because the intuition behind this doesn't really line up to what we're going to be doing, and we're going to have to discuss why because it will make sense after we discuss it, but it won't make sense at face value. All right, let's talk about planning materiality because that's our that's our basis. That's the very first thing we need to establish, and that's what we're going to be reporting on. So, planning materiality is the maximum amount by which the auditor believes the financial statements could be misstated and still not affect the decisions of users, all right? So we know that something like a dollar is not enough. $10 is not enough. $100, $1,000, we get to $10,000, we're starting to get to the point where like, okay, that might be sufficient. Get to $100,000, like, okay, that's more than material. At some point, the users will say, all right, they'll go from not caring to starting to care. Materiality is that amount at which they say, all right, now I care about the, the amount that the financial statements are misstated by. Anything below that, don't care about. Anything above that, they do care about. Which is hard to quantify because it's different for different people. Like, for example, if I say, uh, you have, you think that you've got $20 in your wallet, but you actually only have 19. Some people in this room would be like, oh, it's a dollar, I don't care. Some people in this room is about, where's my dollar? Okay, there's gonna be differences for different people, how they evaluate that. So how do the auditing standards tell us to evaluate? Well, they require the auditor to establish materiality amount as a whole for the financial statements as a whole. You know what they don't do? They don't tell us how to do it. They don't provide specific guidance on it. So this is something that firms have to determine on their own, which is why I've got the Jackie Chan meme in here, because it makes no sense. You'd think that if they want consistency and materiality, they would provide guidelines. So we're going to talk about the rules that uh, accounting firms generally follow, and we're going to use those as our basis. So some quantitative benchmarks for establishing materiality, our most common one is going to be the first one, which is income before taxes. It says loss in parentheses, but usually if the company is, has a loss for a period, we won't use that as a basis because that's kind of silly. That's a negative dollar amount. Usually it's going to be whatever the pre-tax income is. We can also use total assets, total revenues, net assets, total equities. These are all fine bases. These are our quantitative basis. This is basically saying, this is the dollar amount that we're gonna use to determine what materiality is. Now, note, when I say the basis, I'm not saying income before taxes that our materiality amount. I'm saying that we will use that to compute what materiality is. Usually it will be a percentage of one of these bases. All right, so we're gonna see in, a, in the next slide, our general guideline is going to be 5% of income before taxes. That will be what we default to in most of our scenarios. Qualitative factors will be makes basically situations where we will adjust those numbers. We will adjust that percentage, okay? These are usually going to be areas where we think that there are risk factors or there's risk associated with the situation where we might want to make that number smaller, that materiality amount smaller. How do we do that? we make our percentage that we multiply by smaller. 
So instead of saying I'm going to do 5% of income before taxes, I might do 4.5% or 4%. What are some quanti qualitative factors? Material of misstatement in prior years. So we think that there's misstatements from previous years, or we know there's misstatements from previous years. That increases the likelihood there's misstatement in the current year. So we want to be extra cautious. We want to use a smaller materiality amount. High risk of fraud. The, we think that there's a, a possibility that the financial statements could be misstated due to intentional manipulation. So we could uh, we want to make sure that that amount's smaller. Potential loan covenant violations. Does everybody, everybody remember loan covenant violations? We talked about it very briefly in AIS. Does everybody know what I mean by that? So a company engages in a loan with a, uh, with a bank and in order to maintain that loan, they have to have certain financial indicators they have to meet. So they have to maintain a debt to equity ratio of no more than two. They have to maintain a liquidity ratio of at least 1.2 or a current ratio of at least 1.2. They basically have financial numbers that they have to meet as a company. And if they fail to meet those, then they're in violation of that debt agreement. So if there's potential loan covenant violations, what is a company likely to do? They're likely to misstate their numbers in order to make sure they're in compliance with those numbers. So that's a potential issue there. If small amounts may cause the entity to misforecast revenues or earnings or the effect of trended earnings. So materiality for the company as a whole is $10 million, but they only earned a million dollars in income this current period. So if the, or if the financial misstatements are misstated or financial statements are misstated by $5 million, we may say that's not material. And since materiality is $10 million, that would be a correct statement. But what if they were saying that the financial statements are overstated, earnings are overstated by $5 million? If I decrease earnings by $5 million, they're now at a $4 million loss. So it's possible that if that number, that income number is really, really small, that a very, very minor adjustment to earnings could actually affect it from being a profit to a loss, which will change the perception of stakeholders. Or the entity operates in a volatile business environment, has complex operations, or it operates in a highly regulated industry. We're going to talk about this as a, a risk factor in the next chapter. But when risks are present within the organization and there's operations, that actually may affect how we assess materiality as well. So again, to keep in mind, we're going to establish a basis. That's our quantitative factor, our quantitative benchmark. We're going to establish a basis for calculating materiality. Then we're going to consider whether we need to adjust materiality based on risk factors that we've identified in the organization. All right. So here's some basics that we're going to be talking about. Remember that I talked about that our rule of thumb, which is vernacular for our basic guideline, our general rule is going to be 5% of income before taxes. And I want you to think when you calculate materiality in this course, that's your very first stop. All right. No matter what other things that are present, present the very first place you go is like, all right, I'm going to use 5% of income before taxes. Is that appropriate in this situation? And I will say in most of the situations we'll encounter in this course, the answer will probably be, Yes. Okay. I said most and probably in the same sentence. That really doesn't help, does it, guys? All right. So uh, in many of the scenarios that we'll look at, there we go. Many of the scenarios we'll look at. So for public and private profit-oriented companies, we're generally going to use that basis, uh, income before taxes. We may adjust the 5%. We may make that number lower if we think that there are increased risks present in the organization. But our default is 5% of pre-tax income. There may be some scenarios that we don't want to use pre-tax income. So let's talk about why that might be the case, okay? So not-for-profit companies, just a simple question. In a not-for-profit company, would profit be an appropriate basis for materiality? Probably not, okay? So income before taxes is probably not a good way to evaluate their operations, which is why we might use total revenues or total assets, okay? Then we have asset-based companies like investment groups or mutual funds, all right? So they are a profit-based entity, but how many assets do they have to hold in order to maintain or to, to generate profit? Has anybody ever looked at the balance sheet of a, a place like a Charles Schwab or someplace like that that actually maintains mutual funds? The amount of assets they have to maintain is massive relative to the revenues they generate and rel or rel well, rel relative to the income they generate. So gener or judging on income is going to be problematic because they've got such a massive asset portfolio. Their entire operations are based on returns from their assets. So in that case, we probably want to evaluate total assets or net assets. So those are the corner case scenarios. In most of our situations, we're going to be operating here, okay? Most of our situations here, but be very careful when you're going through scenarios to make sure you judge, judge it. Yes? So when would we use equity as a benchmark? 
Uh, so if like, say, for example, that I had great uh, volatility in like, uh, like a good example, be not for profit companies, like volatility in revenues and assets from peer, uh, from period to period and equity remained pretty uh, consistently stable. I'd probably use equity in that situation. It is kind of a case to case basis. By the way, you don't need to memorize these percentages. The one that I want you to remember is 5% of income before taxes. If there's a scenario where I think you should use a different percentage, I will give you the guidelines personally. I will actually provide you with guidelines to use in those calculations. All right. So tolerable misstatements. We've talked about planning materiality. This is how we assign materiality at the financial statements as a whole. Now we need to go to each individual line item and we need to say, all right, here's the materiality we're going to assign for each account. All right, this is going to get a little bit confusing, and I'm going to try to reinforce what I'm about to discuss with an example. We're actually going to look at what part of your homework for uh, this coming Wednesday, for Wednesday, so or I guess two days from now. Uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what you need to remember for tolerable misstatement. So first of all, auditors generally set maximum tolerable misstatement for a single account between 50 and 75% of planning materiality. Now, what this means is, is that I'm going to set my planning materiality and then I'm going to determine the maximum amount that I can assign to any one account is going to be X percentage. And that percentage usually falls within the range of 50 to 75%. In most of the scenarios we're gonna talk about, it's either gonna be 50 or it's gonna be 75. Basically what that means is the most that you can assign to any one account is going to be 50% of income before tax, or 50% of, no, 50 of whatever we determine planning materiality is. That does not mean that every single account is going to be set at 50% of planning materiality. It means that is the highest amount that I can use. And once we've established that percentage, that percentage is locked in stone. Now, the reason I mentioned this, okay, this is one of my massive gripes with the publisher, all right? They had this correct three uh, three editions ago. They had this actually explained really well in the textbook. Then somebody came in who does not know a thing about materiality, somebody who's an editor and say, this is really confusing. I'm going to clean this up. Made a whole bunch of changes to the worksheet that you're going to be working on and actually changed the information in the textbook to where it was 100% wrong. Okay. So they basically said, oh, every single account should be between 50 and 70% 5 of 5% of planning materiality. No, that's not the way it works. I'm saying that the maximum amount that we can assign to any one account is going to be at as some percentage of planning materiality, whether that be 50%, whether it be 75%, or some amount in between. We don't vary that range. We actually set the range, and then that's the maximum amount we assign. And it, intuitively speaking, it makes perfect sense, okay? Say you've got one account that's a million dollars, and you've got another account that's a thousand dollars, and 50% of your planning materiality is $20,000, okay? That means that your million dollar account, you're probably gonna set at $20,000 as your maximum planning materiality, okay? Or maximum tolerable statement. You're not gonna set the same $20,000 at that uh, at that thousand dollar account because there's not $20,000 in that account, okay? So the reason I'm bringing this up, the reason I'm harping on it so much is if you read the book and tried to reinforce it, the book is garbage in this area, okay? The book is absolute garbage. Uh, some of the questions that are some of the content they put in there. And I, I have had I have had knockdown drag out arguments with the publishers about this. It's, it's pretty epic. You know, I could show you some of the emails. OK, uh, yeah. And I, I said, just contact the authors, contact the authors. They will explain that you're wrong. And it's like, you know, we, we referred to the authors on this. They checked it. So of course they check it. They're getting a paycheck now, so they don't care. OK, they don't care. They check it. But this is this is basically what we're saying. We're going to say. Sake of being, we're going to say it 50% of planning materiality or 75% of planning material or somewhat. Once you've established that number, it's locked in stone. We don't, we, that's the maximum amount we can set for any account. And we'll see an example of that in just a second. Firms generally cap the size of aggregate tolerable misstatement for all accounts at three to four times planning materiality. So what this means is, is that we're going to set our, our planning material, sorry, a tolerable misstatement for every single account. We're going to set a number for every single account. When we add all those numbers together, that number, that sum total should be somewhere around three to four times planning materiality. Usually, again, we set that in advance. We say three times planning materiality, four times planning materiality, okay? So we're gonna say the maximum amount of all those numbers added together is gonna to be three times planning materiality or four times planning materiality. And again, the question comes up, why is it so great? Why shouldn't it be uh, the some of those numbers would be less than planning materiality. And that's an excellent question. It's really confusing. The reason why is 
we as auditors should believe that most of these accounts are going to be correct, okay? We would hope that most of the accounts that we're auditing are going to be correct or at least substantially correct. So we should not see massive differences in the account on the scale of the materiality, the tolerable misstatement for every single account. If anything, we're hoping that we only see one or two differences and that those differences are going to be limited. So by adding all the tolerable misstatements together, we're saying that in all likelihood, it's not going to be an error in every single account. It's only going to be an error in a few accounts. So in total, these are going to be less than planning materiality, the true misstatements. But our tolerable misstatements, what we can what we what we can tolerate in every single account will be less than that. Okay, will be in, in aggregate can be more than that, but in less less than reality. Again, we'll take a look at the example that uh, here in just a second, so we can re, uh, reiterate, re, reiterate that. All right. Um, the lower tolerable statement is the more extensive the required auditor testing. So auditors are going to strategically control the testing of individual accounts while retaining a, a planning materiality. So let's think about what this says, because this is this is one that gets really, really confusing when students go through this. When I'm talking about planning materiality, I would like to make sure that if I if I'm if I'm concerned about risk, that I make that number smaller every single time that I think a risk is associated with it. Because remember, I was saying earlier, if there's more risk then I want to be more sure of my assessment. So I'm going to make that number, uh, that number smaller as I go forward. Very rarely will I make materiality larger, simply because it have to be a situation where I think there's almost no risk associated with that, so I can make that number larger because I can accept larger differences. The opposite is kind of true, and it's, it's really, really, really weird. The opposite is kind of true when we talk about tolerable misstatement. When we get to tolerable misstatement, we're going to say, I want to assign as much as I possibly can to larger accounts, to larger accounts or critical accounts so that I can actually have a lot more flexibility. Now, the intuition behind this is really silly. We're gonna talk, talk this, this is the Dr. Barnes Thanksgiving dinner. Does anybody else go home for their big dinners and celebrations and have a family? So let me explain what my family looks like, okay? So it got me, okay, and I enjoy food as everybody in this room knows, okay? So I'm gonna have a big Thanksgiving plate. Then we're gonna have my sister-in-law who is literally half my size and eats twice as much as I do. I don't know what it is. She's just, she was blessed with an incredible, extraordinary metabolism. It's, it's, it's amazing. Then we have my brother who uh, is, uh, he basically, he, he smoked for most of his life. So he doesn't have much of an appetite. So he'll eat about half of what I do. Okay. We have my mother who is uh, literally a third my size and she'll take like two bites and she'll be, I'm done. Okay. And then we have my nieces who are, are, are doing better, but they have this extraordinary ability to not consume any nutrition whatsoever and still have infinite energy. I don't know how that works, okay? I, I'm still working on that. If I don't have any food for like a day, then I'm just kind of like, okay, just kill me now. But uh, yeah, they, 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 can, they can consume nothing and still just be, a, and, and they're, they're getting older now. They're 14 and 10, 13 and 10 now, uh, but for somehow, I guess 14, 11, sorry, 14, 11, but somehow still managed to maintain that. Anyway, um, if we try to judge how we're going to allocate Thanksgiving dinner based on one individual and multiply that times six, it's going to be a really, really weird scenario. If we did it like according to me, it would not work. My sister-in-law would be grumpy and everybody else would have plates full of food that they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't eat. If we did it according to my mom, we barely would have to fix anything. It would basically be like microwave a, a, a thing or microwave a, a TV dinner or something like that. So we have to consider how we're going to do this for every single individual. And that's basically how we do that for accounts in the financial statements. We consider each account on an individual basis. So what are we going to consider? We're going to consider the size, activity, complexity, and risk of the account relative to other accounts and allocating all of the statement. So let's go ahead and take a look. And I'm going to reiterate some of the things that we've talked about here, because again, this is going to be one of those things that's really important to understand. The very first thing I'm going to tell you is when you do these, you're going to feel like I have no idea what the heck I'm doing. And that's actually great. Okay. Cause you're going to be in line with every single ever student who's ever taken this class. Okay. This is not so much that you're trying to get the correct answers, but you understand the intuition of what you're doing. So here's the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to assign a uh, basis for your misstatement. Okay. And then you're going to have to uh, apply a percentage. So what do we say our default is? Oh, so our basis is pre-tax income. So yeah, you're right on 5%. And our default is 5%. Now, there's some options here. You could actually say a pre-tax income, or you could say sales revenue or total assets. 
we would need to make sure that if we're going to assign pre-tax income, that this is a four basis entity. There are also some other considerations that you will want to uh, take, in take, take into account, which I'm not going to discuss now, but I strongly recommend that you read the materiality guidelines that are listed here. I think this is also on the uh, assignment on Brightspace. You want to read through these to make sure you understand what other considerations do we have. But for right now, let's just go ahead and leave it at pre-tax income at 5%. Okay. So that gives us planning materiality of uh, 3,508,000. That means that uh, if, if, if spoiling the uh, materiality guidelines, they've said 75% is going to be their maximum tolerable mistake. But that means that when we go to this next work paper, the most that I can sign to any one area is going to be 75% of this 3,508, okay? Which is roughly, I think, 2.3 million or 2,300, two, two, uh, 2, roughly this number right here. This because this, these dollars are in thousands. That's why I'm saying 2.3 million, okay? So, what are we doing here? What are, so we're going to go through every single account and we're going to try to determine how much am I going to sign here. And some of these are going to be a little bit straight, more straightforward than others. The very first thing I would tell you is read through the accounts that are given to give you some explanation of what you should do for the ones that are not given. So I'm going to do a few to try to help you out. So cash and cash equivalents. So what did I say? Size, activity, complexity, and risk. Those are the factors that we're going to evaluate on. Is this a large account right here? Pretty large. It's about $80 million. Okay. So size is definitely there. Activity is cash a frequent activity account. All right. How about the complexity of cash? What do you guys think? Is cash a complex account? It is the least complex account on the balance sheet? Whatever you have in cash is what you own. Okay. Cash is really, really difficult to misstate. And therefore, it's very easy to audit. So we can make this number pretty small. We can make this number, we'll say, I'm going to say 300. Okay. So is that right? Yeah, we'll say 300. Why is that the case? Because auditing cash is not a particularly difficult uh, task, all right? And this is well within our planning materiality. Remember I said it's had 75% of planning materiality, okay? So this is well within our range. Uh, let's move on. Receivables, what would be an easy one? Uh, accounts payable, okay, accounts payable. What about accounts payable? Is this a particularly large account? 60 million, so it's about pretty large. There's activity frequently accounts payable. Yeah, they're a retail vendor, so they're constantly buying from uh, other from wholesalers. So they're going to be buying there. What about complexity? Is this more complex than cash? Is it more challenging? You think to to determine what accounts payable is? Probably so. Think about think about when you learned accounts payable back in financial accounting. Which could you compute easier, cash or accounts payable? Cash. Cash is much easier to find. So determining accounts payable is challenging. As we'll start thinking about auditing procedures a little bit later on in this course. They're not difficult, but they are definitely more complicated than doing a bank reconciliation. So um, we can say there's a little bit more complexity there. We're going to make this number a little bit larger. So let's go ahead and let's say we're going to make this uh, 1,500. Okay. So basically what you would do here is say this, this is easy to audit. Probably some more information there too, but I'm just going to go really quickly. When I do accounts payable, I say large account. Large and significant account. Okay. So I'm going to go through this. Uh, I did that the wrong one. Uh, control, uh, uh. I'll try my best, guys. All right. There we go. All right. It's large as can. And we do that for the rest of the accounts. We try to make some justification for why we're assigning that. At the end, what we're trying to do is we're trying to put numbers in here where this total amount of total statement, the sum of all these numbers right here is going to be as close to four times this 3508, okay? Now you'll notice down here, it says the amount of total statement out to match account should be below four times materiality in order to limit aggregation risk. So basically what we're saying is the sum of these numbers right here, we want, it, we want those to be as close to four as possible without going over. It's like the price is right, okay? Why are we doing that? Let's talk about both reasons, because both of these are really, really important. Why are we making this so large? It's like the more that we assign to every single account, the more error we can tolerate. All right. If I make this one dollar, let's say I say I'm going to make this literally one dollar. I know it's only it's that's actually three hundred thousand and not or that would be a thousand dollars. I make that one dollar. How much testing do I have to do to find dollars that are errors that are a dollar or less? 
I have to test everything, okay? Does anybody want to test every single cash transaction that the company has? Probably not. Okay, that's why I don't make that a dollar. That's why I'm going to make that a large, uh, large amount, all right? So the more that I can assign, the easier my job is, the easier my job is. So I want to make that number higher. But the question comes up then is that uh, it wouldn't make that number so high mean that uh, we're going to have some amount that eventually will be greater than 3.5 million? Well, if I go through and I test, do I expect errors in every single one of these accounts? I hope not. I would that, that would be a miserable audit, okay? At least not material errors. I'm assuming that my accounts are going to be reasonably close, especially the accounts with smaller balances and less activity. I would expect that my numbers be close. So if I don't expect to see this amount misstated in every single account, I can set these numbers really large, but I still don't anticipate to have massive errors in every single account. So I want this number, when I add all these numbers together, to be as close to four as I possibly can. If I go over that, that's too much. If I'm less than that, if I'm like at 3.9, that's perfect, okay? That means that I've given my enough self enough wiggle room that I can accept some errors, but it's not so much that I uh, that the errors are massive, okay? That is kind of the logic behind here. And by the way, like I said, when you're going through this process, you're gonna be like, I just, I'm not sure if this is right. The goal here is not to get accuracy. Nobody in this room is going to match what the solution says. I don't, my, I, I've been teaching this for nine years now. I still don't come anywhere close to the solution but I understand the intuition behind every single answer. And that's what the goal is to come up with intuitions that be able to answer the, to be able to justify your decision in every single scenario. I would even argue that if you did this exercise twice, if you did the homework twice without knowing what your first set of answers were, your answers on the first uh, assignment are gonna be different from your answers in the second assignments. Just human nature right there. This is why this is a quantitative exercise, but it has qualitative applications. All right, going back here. So once, uh, once we get to the end, we evaluate audit findings. Now I wanna make a delineation here because this is always confusing. What we've done so far is we have said, we want to determine what the materiality, the planning materiality of the amount that the entire set of financial statements can be misstated by and still be okay. That's planning materiality. Then we want to assign tolerable misstatement. This is the amount that any one account can be misstated by and be fine. And this is different for every single account. When we start auditing, we're going to observe actual misstatements in accounts. We're going to determine, oh, this account is misstated by some amount of dollars. Our goal here now is to determine what the misstatements we observe are relative to what we can tolerate and what we have set for planning materiality as a whole. So what happens in this situation? So what are we going to do? Well, we're gonna gather information. We're gonna aggregate misstatements. These are the actual misstatements we observe. We're gonna take that aggregate actual misstatement and compare that to overall materiality. If the aggregate misstatement is less than the overall materiality, we can conclude that the financial statements are fairly presented. In other words, I have five misstatements and they total, they sum total, uh, they, in some total they're a million dollars. I compare that to my planning materiality. And I said my planning materiality was $2 million. When I compare those two numbers, I notice that the total misstatements are less than what I can tolerate in the financial statements in a whole. And I'm like, this is great. I don't have to worry about it. The number is too small for me to care about. Also important to note, we do need to evaluate the performance or the, the, the misstatements at the account level. So even though my total misstatements are fine, what if I had an account where I had set tolerable misstatement for the account at 500,000 and the misstatement of that account was 600,000. That would be a situation where I'd be like, all right, there's a problem here. This account is too high or, is over, or has too much error for me to accept. The solution in that situation and the situation where the accounts as a whole are misstated are the same. We as auditors, we would go to the client and we'd say, your accounts are misstated or your financial statements are misstated, please make an adjustment. And this looks exactly like an adjusting entry what you learned, or that you learned back in your previous financial accounting classes. We just say, all right, if accounts receivable is overstated by a million dollars, we'd say, please make an adjustment to reduce accounts receivable by a million dollars. That's all there is to it. And we're going to see that over and over again. We'll see that multiple times in this course, but this is the basic intuition behind this. All right. I know that was a lot to take in. There's a lot to absorb there. Trust me, I say it'll become easier with more exposure. Are there any questions? Yes. So if they like disagree, is that when you have a qualified opinion? Yes. That would be where we say, all right, we believe that your financial statements are misstated. 
we cannot issue an opinion that says that they are not misstated. Yeah, so that's that's a qualified opinion or in extreme situations, an adverse opinion or a uh, disclaimer opinion. Okay, uh, we have a discussion to go over. This is one of the things I want you to prepare for. So we are going to be taking the role of auditors with a company called Wills and Adams. They're CPAs, all right? And we're going to be auditing earthwear clothiers. Now, we've already talked about this already. We've already looked at some examples, but what is the nature of Earthwork Clothier's business? Yeah, they're re retail or merchandising company. They they sell, they're like L.L. Bean type company, which is a little bit outdated. I will say that the risks, this 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 original book is uh, currently on 12th edition. I think the original version of the books was late 90s, early 2000s, back before Amazon and other companies, all online retailers were really popular. So I think that this is kind of an outdated company, but... It is what we have to work with is the book. Other, other than that, this is actually a pretty good, uh, pretty good scenario and a pretty good case. <laughs> so I asked you to do some digging. I want you to find out some information about this company. So let's go ahead and read some information on the narrative because I think that there's some details that are very relevant to this particular, uh, this particular scenario. So uh, I want you to read the background. So uh, some information about the fo founding of Earthwares, uh, Earthware and then... Uh, uh, they decided to go public in 1996, and uh, they've been audited uh, <clears throat> audited by uh, Wilson Adams. Uh, you know this is listed in there, so maybe it's a different side. So uh, basically, okay, uh, the 1996, they retained uh, they uh, they retained Wilson Adams as the auditors. So auditors, uh, Wilson Adams and the auditors in 1986. So a very long time, good working relationship probably a big clue as to what our decision is going to be here since we've been auditing now for almost 40 years okay a uh, little bit about the a uh, little bit about the industry it's outdoor clothing industry a lot of competitors in there they say the industry is highly competitive is a highly competitive industry is that a risk to an organization it is a risk to an organization it's something we need to keep in mind okay so something that will actually affect all parts of the audit so let's go ahead and keep that in mind and we're going to think about that through the rest of the course all right uh, so some management issues, some interesting things that are going on. So in late February 2022, Earthways Chief Accounting Officer, Controller Brad Norton, unexpectedly left, left the company to take a job with another clothing manufacturer. All right. That a risk by itself? Probably not. But there is some other information that's associated with that. A new controller, Carol McKay, was selected in November. All right. Uh, how will we characterize Carol McKay in this situation? They think that she may have been promoted without justification because she doesn't look like she's got the qualifications to do the job. Is an executive that working an executive in the company is that a that doesn't know how to do their job? Is that a risk? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So it says at the bottom, some executive questions McKay had the broad skill set might needed for such a demanding position. After interacting during some of the recent meetings, even some of Willis and Adams professionals questioned McKay's qualifications for the job. Interesting. By the way, it's important to keep in mind, this is an older text, so we are talking about the 2022 audit. I know we're living in 2024. The good news is you already know what everything that happened in 2022. So yeah, you go go look back at the past. All right. So anyway, uh, joking around. Um, and then we had the new computer system. Uh, computer system was, uh, they integrated it in 2021. It looked like in late 2021 that there were some problems. Uh, there were some issues in third and fourth quarters but they were largely resolved and the company began seeing benefits um, and customer satisfaction increased. Now, some hiccups in the AIS, can we say that that's probably a concern as well? Yes, but maybe we've actually managed to resolve most of those, but something to keep in mind. All right, going back, let's answer some questions now. Are there any business risks the auditor should consider as part of the decision? There may have been a reason why I was asking you to identify business risks. Okay, so what did we say was the first one? Competitive industry, yeah, competitive industry, okay. So something that we're gonna keep in mind, and by the way, this will come up on Wednesday too. We're gonna to talk about this in nature of risk on Wednesday. All right, uh, what else? Yeah, this, this, yeah. so the uh, system is problematic, and then we also have the uh, change, in, uh, change in executives, which again, turnover in executive position, that's not unusual. But having the uh, the new executive be unqualified for the job is kind of unusual. So those are kind of the three that uh, that I primarily talk about. Anything else that you found as part of your digging? There's actually some other information that we could talk about out there, but uh, those are the three major ones. I just had a question. Yes. The non reoccurring charge on the minimum statement from your computer system. I honestly don't know. I haven't looked too much into detail on that, but uh, that's an excellent question. Yeah, it's not something it's something I've ever looked into, but uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm going to have to investigate that now. All right. So um, 
are there any incidents that's just an issue with management integrity? Now, the reason I bring this up is that I, I assigned you uh, three items to read. I actually assigned you, uh, actually, I guess a couple items to read. I actually assigned you the background, which will become uh, relevant as we uh, move forward. But I also said, hey, here's the original uh, spreadsheet assignment. You didn't need to complete the spreadsheet, but I'd like you to review it. Did anybody find anything about management integrity in there? I see some nods, which makes me really happy. So what did we find about management integrity? Illegal gambling. Yeah, if we go over, it says over here. All right. Vice President of Finance Don Evans was charged with a misdemeanor involving illegal gambling on college basketball games. The charge of letter dropped. Uh, agreed to pay a fine of seven hundred fifty and pay fifty eight dollars or fifty hours of community service. Uh, nowhere other ethical problems were found with any other authority executive. All right. So that seems to be another risk, but it seems to be a risk of a different nature and. I want to hold on to this because we're not don't have the framework to talk about this right now. Actually, Madeline has the framework, but she's our take forensics, so she she can talk about this. But uh, we don't have the framework to talk about this now. We will have the framework to talk about this next week. Okay, we will talk about this next week, and we're going to use this as a specific example. But we're going to say this is a risk, but we need to be able to better define this risk. Okay, because this is an important point to note. Suffice to say that if this was a major problem, this could actually lead to some substantial issues if left unchecked. So we need to basically make sure we keep that. So another risk that we could identify, but it's not an immediately obvious risk until we start thinking about this in a much different perspective. So ultimately, we have to ask a question. This is a client continuation question. And you have to answer, all right, based on everything I know, based on these risks that I've identified, based on the concerns that I might have about moving forward with audit, is this a client that I want to continue holding on for audit? What do you guys think? See, a lot of people nodding heads. I would agree. I think this is a fantastic client, okay? I've had some students in the past that said, no, there's just too much risk associated with this. Especially for publicly traded companies, you will not find a company with this minimal level of risk. We identified a few isolated risks. If we got, tried to go into other public companies and tried to do the same procedure, we would have like pages and pages of risks, okay? So the only reason that you might answer, no, we're not going to continue on with this client. You're going to say they're hiding something. This is too clean a company. This is too clean a company. The answer is it's not too clean a company. This is a, a fictitious company, so they're not going to do all the detail on this, all right? So yeah, it's important to keep in mind here that we are running a business as auditors. And so we need to be very, very conscientious about the fact that if we've got a client that we are very well aware of the aware of the risks, we can address those. We can adjust those. Something we're going to be looking at on Wednesday is how do we frame our audit in order to be able to address adjust and address risks, uh, address risks that are present within an organization. So I want you to keep this in mind. We are going to say we're going to accept this client. If you don't want to accept this client, then I don't know what to do because this is the client we're going to be using for the rest of the course. All right. So if you don't want to accept this client, we got a problem. But we are going to accept this client and we're going to say this is the client we're using moving forward. And again, when we identify these risks, these become relevant as we start doing the rest of our procedures, especially since our next step is risk assessment. We've identified some of the risks so we can use that moving forward. All right, uh, that's it for today. I will see you all on Wednesday.